Good morning everyone, hope you're all having a wonderful day today. Today we're going to be talking about the Lead Star Arms Grunt 3 Complete AR-15. But before we get into the video, I do need to say that Gun Deals, if you don't know, is a website that compiles some of the best deals in the internet. So whatever it is that you're looking for can probably be found on their website or at least a link to it for the best possible price. Now they don't buy or sell anything. They can only point you in the right direction. And most importantly, they don't take your money. So if saving money on cool gear is important to you and something you like to do, go ahead and check them out. Once again, that is Gun dot deals now while you're here watching the video you might as well like share and subscribe and comment literally anything down below now full disclosure on the lead star arms grunt 3 this was actually sent out to us by palmetto state armory which is a company that of course carries these as well so while we did not get this directly from lead star arms uh, we did get this for free now uh, that being said, we have no relationship with Lead Star Arms whatsoever. Lead Star Arms is a smaller company that's sort of local to Palmetto State Armory, I believe. So Palmetto, Palmetto State Armory also carries their rifles. And they sell a sort of competition-oriented-ish, uh, mid-range or sort of budget ARs. I wouldn't really call them budget ARs because this Lead Star Arms Grunt 3 as it sits right now is around a thousand dollars for the complete rifle. Now that's not outrageously exp expensive especially for the features that you're getting in this that's going to put you right in the same area as like the sig treads or the ruger sr556 or your springfield whatever else they're kind of budget uh mid-tier ars like a uh, smith and wesson sport 2 or something like that it's going to be right in that same price point maybe a little bit higher but again you are going to be getting some nicer features on this ar and this is a little bit more of a competition oriented AR-15. So let's go ahead and get into some of the specifics. The most noticeable thing on this gun is going to be the 17 inch handguard, which is already a very, very long handguard and the 16 inch barrel. Now this is set up to perfectly fit in with their two port muzzle brake. Now we'll get into details on the muzzle brake, but basically this is set up to run like this. You shouldn't really be switching out the muzzle device or anything else like that because it's really designed to be working with their included muzzle device. If you like that, good. If you like no recoil on your AR-15, awesome. However, if you're looking for more of a duty rifle or something you can put on a flash hider and a suppressor with this, muscle device and handguard, you're not obviously gonna be able to do that. So for competition or a very, very fast fun gun to shoot, absolutely. But again, if you're already looking for like a duty oriented, this is not really going to fit that niche for you. Now the handguard does have a mostly chopped off Picatinny rail section on top. You have a little bit here in the back by the barrel nut and of course a little bit at the end for say your iron sights and that's about all the room you're gonna get. That being said, you do of course have M-Lock at the three, six, and nine all the way up and down this rail. So there is still a ton of rail space. Then at the end of the handguard, you also have two QD points, which is quite nice if you like to run your slings that far out. But me personally, I like to have mine a little bit further back, which is why they also have two at the back of the handguard as well. Now, all of that is all well and good. This is 6061 T6 aluminum hard coat anodized. At the back here, the mounting solution is of course a steel barrel nut, which is good. We like to see steel barrel nuts in general. It also has two very small anti-rotation tabs that fit on either side of your upper receiver to help lock it down in place. And then our mounting system is actually quite nice. So on the left side here, we have a steel locking block and then we have two bolts that fit into that locking block and then torque down. Now, I like to see straight up large locking blocks like this versus just uh, a steel bolt into aluminum threads. I am much more uh, comfortable with steel on steel versus steel on aluminum because of course that aluminum is always going to give first. And what this means is you're able to get one a lot more torque on the handguard itself, but also more concentric pressure because of course it's torquing down across this entire lock block versus just two points on your handguard. So 
In terms of the handguard design for a competition style build, it's actually very, very good. I like it a lot. Um, it is a little bit long, of course, because it's blocking off the muzzle device if you wanted to swap out the muzzle device. But again, that's just something you're going to be getting into with this gun in general. The lockup is very, very good. So if you did have something all the way out here that needed to maintain zero, you would have a very good chance of that holding zero. So now getting into the muzzle brake itself, this is of course, as I mentioned, a two port brake. And on a 5.56 gun with a muzzle device of this size, it is incredibly effective. It is made out of, I believe, 4140 chrome moly vanadium steel, which is a very strong, very tough steel, all good there. On top of that, all of theirs come pre-drilled for a pinned and weld. So if say you had a 14 inch or a 14 and a half inch barrel with a 15 inch handguard, you could pin and weld and then it would be a legal 16 inch. For me, for a competition gun, I would rather see a 16 or an 18 inch barrel anyways, but it is a nice feature to have on your muzzle devices. It is, of course, timed with a crush washer, and something really nice that I like about it is that it's sort of a tunable muzzle brake. So at the front of it here, on the top of it, I should say, you have all of these nice little dimples that are like halfway drilled out. That is for you to tune the amount of vertical recoil control with your specific ammunition and buffers. Now, me personally, I prefer neutral. Uh, I prefer if there's going to be any recoil on a gun, I want it to be up and down because that is the easiest to control. I want it to naturally recoil up and then as the bolt slams back forward and picks up around, it should come right back down. If you like the gun to not move whatsoever, you could probably drill out you know, two to four of those. And if you like a little bit of downward pressure and you feel like that's easier for you to fire faster, then you could drill out more. That is a feature I don't think a lot of people are going to take advantage of, but it is something very nice to see, especially at this price point. And if they were all drilled out from the factory, I think it would be a less pleasurable shooting experience. Uh, for me personally, when you start to have a lot of top mounted holes on a muzzle brake or on some sort of recoil reduction device, it does tend to drive the front end of the gun down. And I prefer neutral just like it is. So overall, they did do a very good job on the muzzle device. And again, it can be a little bit tuned if you want to. Now, the barrel profile, this is another thing that they did right. This is a 4150 chrome moly vanadium uh, barrel that is nitrided. This is what I consider to be a middleweight profile. They claim that it's an A2 profile. Uh, what that means to me is you do have a little bit thicker of a profile than you would on a government in the back. And then you have a straight taper that's the same profile towards the end of the muzzle device. You of course have a 0.750 gas block journal and then a slight taper down to the profile that it is in the back. And so you have a very not a heavy barrel, but definitely heavier than some other profiles on the market a lot better than like an M4 or even a government, uh, because of course you do have that extra material in the back here as well for more rigidity. And so this is a little bit more tuned to be a little bit more accurate and a little bit heavier because again, in a competition sort of sense, you're not worried about ounces because every ounce that you add onto the gun in the right places, of course, is going to give you a softer shooting gun because of course, that weight is going to be absorbing that recoil. On top of this, this is a 223 wild chambering, which is a hybrid chambering between 556 and 223, designed to be able to handle the pressures of 556 and take advantage of the accuracy characteristics of 223. So, again, for a competition, not like a hard duty use. 50,000 round gun, uh, 223 wild chambering is the proper chambering as well as the twist rate of one in eight. You can debate whether one in seven or one in eight is better. Generally speaking with a one in eight, you will get a much wider accuracy curve with different loads where one in seven might be perfectly optimized for say 70 grains and up. A one in eight, generally speaking, of course, this is gonna be different from barrel to barrel and ammunition to ammunition. A one in eight in general, will give you a very wide, very soft accuracy curve with a wide variety of bullet weights. So one in eight, again, for a competition style gun where you might not only be shooting 77 grain OTMs all the time, you might be shooting a wide mix of ammunition. So if there's, especially on like a short range stage, you might only be shooting 55 grains because those are gonna recoil very, very soft. So two, two, three wild, one in eight twist, 16 inch barrel threaded one half by 28 of course at the end proper material choice proper nitride coating looks really good 
The one downside that I will say about this barrel, and one of the biggest knocks about this gun overall, is that they did not dimple the barrel, and the gas block screws are actually protruding about one to two threads from the bottom of the gas block. I'm not sure if they're just using uh, gas block screws that are too long, but the barrel itself, I did take off the gas block to check. It is not dimpled, so it's just the pressure of those two gas block screws at like, you know, 25 or 30 inch pounds pushing up against that barrel seal. So theoretically, that is not a very solid lockup. Again, it's not a duty gun, and I did not have any issues with the rifle whatsoever, but I like to see dimpling at least, and then of course, pinning is like the top tier echelon of durability. Not really needed on a competition gun, but I would at least like to see it dimpled. And actually on this gas block, you'll see it in one of the slow-mo shots, there, I got a little bit of gas blow-by on the gas block, which means that uh, for whatever reason, just in the initial, you know, 500 rounds or so that we've tested on it so far, the the lockup between the gas block journal and the gas block itself is not quite perfect. So some of that gas was escaping out of the sides and actually burned a hole in one of my gloves. And you should be able to see that in the slow-mo. Um, so not a huge deal and you know every now and again you're going to get a slightly sloppy fit between a specific barrel and a specific gas block probably only an issue with this specific gun but again i still would like to see them all dimpled because i believe none of them are dimpled so i would like to see them dimpled now a nice touch is that they do have a black nitride gas tube Again, it's just a nice touch. It looks nice, that's about it. It does look a little bit better than like a standard stainless. In terms of performance, you're never going to notice a performance difference between a black nitride and a just straight up stainless steel um, uh, stainless steel gas tube. So a little bit of a visual improvement, but other than that, nothing special. Now, moving back, the BCG is also a fairly standard affair. We do have a very nice black nitride. The machining is done very, very well. The carrier itself is 8620. The bolt is Carpenter 158, which is the standard mil spec uh, material choice. It's a good material. You can argue between 9310 and Carpenter 158, but at the end of the day, as long as both are done to spec, they're both going to be very, very good choices. Now, we did check the extractor on there and it is powered with a Viton O-ring enhanced or just an O-ring enhanced. I'm not sure if it's the Viton O-ring, but basically that just means that you're going to be getting really good extraction force. On top of that, it ran really, really well. We had no issues with it whatsoever. Uh, the bolt itself is MPI tested, which is good. So it's magnetic particle and tested for any sort of imperfections or cracks that you obviously can't see that are in the material itself. So the bolt while nothing special or the bolt carrier group isn't really anything special, it is definitely going something that is going to get the job done. So uh, again, not necessarily a massive improvement. It is a standard M4 profile or M16 profile BCG, forward assist cuts, again, very, very standard. Now, one very nice touch on the Grunt 3 is they do have this very aggressive, very, very oversized charging handle on the Grunt 3. It is nicely knurled up front. It has a lot of grip surface on it. And it is extremely easy to just grip and rip if you have a malfunction a dead primer something else like that you can very quickly very easily even with gloves on just get up there rip it out and you're good to go the upper receiver itself is a standard mil spec affair which is a lot of what's going on here is going to be fairly standard mil spec sort of stuff it is a 7075 T6 aluminum upper receiver. It is forged, not billet, uh, which is preferable for me for weight and cost. It is not T-marked on top, if you care. It does, of course, also have the Grunt 3 logo on the side, which is not engraved. It's some sort of uh, painting or stenciling that's on there. It looks fine, and it does, of course, separate it a little bit, so you can tell what it is right out of the box. The lower receiver is also a very standard mil spec affair. Uh, it is, of course, a Lead Star Arms mil spec up lower receiver. It doesn't really have much of a flared magwell. That is something that I would have liked to see on more of a competition oriented gun. Now, when it comes to the trigger, grip, stock, and end plate, I think that they did a very good job here. Now, my specific Grunt 3 shipped with a Hyperfire ED T trigger, which is their enhanced duty trigger. At least I believe that's the model. It feels exactly like my other EDT trigger. And so what that means is you get a mil spec feeling trigger. It breaks at about five pounds. So it's already about one to two pounds lighter than a standard mil spec, but it has basically no take up and a very, very nice break. Very nice thing about the EDT trigger as well. 
is that it has a very positive reset so it really pushes your finger forward which is very nice and again has that no take up whatsoever the tiniest bit of rolling brake before like a five pound brake and then again of course a very nice very positive audible tactile reset so the trigger on here while nothing crazy like a competition trigger for me i was able to run it very very quickly the reset to me having a very positive very forced tactile reset that helps me the most when it comes to just raw splits and so with this gun with the virtually zero recoil i was able to get very very quick with it now moving back to the grip we have a very nice over molded rubberized grip some people like rubberized some people like just like the hard polymer grips personally i think this is very very comfortable very grippy in my hands it does have kind of a standard a2 angle without the bump of course but it works quite well is very very comfortable if i haven't mentioned it already the safety is just your standard ar-15 mil spec safety nothing special although you don't really need anything special even in a competition oriented sense the stock they did a very good job with we are running a carbine buffer tube carbine buffer carbine spring as well so everything is just standard in the back which is very nicely tuned for the way that this is gas which we'll talk about in just a second but it is a six position lightweight polymer stock with a rubber pad on the back very very nicely done it is lightweight it's very smooth does not have too much wobble in it um, one thing that i do like about it is it again has cutie cups in two different places so depending on how you like to run your slings it has all of the cutie points you could ever want now on the end plate as well you also have another cutie point so again however you like to run your slings out of the box this is set up for however you want to do it the castle nut while it is torqued down properly is not staked a properly torqued castle nut shouldn't come loose but i still like to see staking on everything because that is again just an additional bit of security so that about does it for the basics about what is actually the grunt three rifle but as you'll hopefully be able to tell from the footage the intro and everything else that i'm rolling in this is a very fast rifle it is gassed uh, this is a mid-length gas system on a 16 inch barrel which is the proper gas length on a 16 inch barrel we are getting ejection with brass like sdi m193 at about 330 ish and then steel about again 330 to four o'clock depending on the brand of ammunition and the temperature outside uh, there were times where we were testing this in freezing temperatures zero malfunctions everything very strong extraction very good ejection no problems whatsoever and all the other magazines that i've tested it with this is just a very very flat very very fast ar-15 and of course a lot of that is going to come down to the very well tuned and designed muzzle brake the proper gas system length and gas port size and the very good trigger now you don't need anything special on an ar-15 to make it run fast you know put in a decent trigger even a decent mil spec trigger you can be very very fast very accurate with put on a decent muzzle brake you don't need to go all overboard and put on some insanely oversized muzzle brake just a decent muzzle brake like this with a proper gas system length and setting is going to be very very quick so out of the box this has been 100 percent reliable and has been incredibly smooth incredibly fast probably currently the fastest ar-15 that i own now that being said this isn't like a uber expensive competition rifle so this is kind of bridging the gap between like a standard ar-15 for say five six seven hundred bucks this is going to be a little bit more expensive than that but it's certainly not going to be like a jp or something where it starts at like two thousand dollars and for that thousand dollars or so you are getting a very nicely designed handguard for its intended use case application you're getting a very well thought out muzzle brake a properly gassed and tuned barrel of course you're getting a very good trigger and the rest of it is fairly mil spec decent stock decent charging handle and that's about it now in terms of accuracy on it we did do some accuracy testing at 100 yards unfortunately the loads that i had on hand were just not all that varied and not good not all that good to begin with we did shoot of course just some m193 through it and it did about two and a half to three inches which is pretty average for that ammunition in every gun that I've tested it in. We did some uh, Frontier 68 grain, 
with Hornady bullets, that's really bad ammunition. Really inconsistent ammunition does not perform well in basically anything that I've tested. And on top of that, we also tried some ADI 69 grain match. Now, I wasn't really able to get any great groups out of it, but I didn't have any great ammunition on hand to test. Uh, with all the distances that I was shooting at, including taking this gun out to 500 yards with just a red dot, it performed very, very well. I was able to hit whatever it is that I was aiming at, no problem. So, I have no doubt if you have access to a lot of high quality loads and were able to tune this gun or tune a load for this specific gun with this barrel, you're going to be getting very, very good accuracy. However, again, in my personal testing with the ammunitions that I had on hand, I couldn't really get anything under like an inch and a half or so. But if you're looking for a factory gun, can you spend less and get more? Well, that I'm actually not too sure about. Now, if you know a specific gun at a specific price point that will do the same or better than this at like say seven or 800 bucks, absolutely let me know in the comments down below and I would love to check that out and compare it against the Leadstar Arms Grunt 3. So again, if you have a suggestion of something to compare this to for similar price points or of course a little bit less as well, let me know in the comments down below. Now. That being said, I do think that lead star arm still could increase or do a couple things a little bit nicer for around the same price. So first off, I would of course dimple the barrel. I like to see that. I like to see that it's a gas block that's not going to move whatsoever. I would hopefully, it might be a little bit more expensive, but I would like to see a little bit of a flared magwell for a competition oriented gun, something that makes reloads a little bit faster, a little bit easier. And I would also like to see an extended uh, magazine or sorry, bolt release. I think those are very nice. They, and so something a little bit bigger and longer, like even the Strike Industries Quick Latch, uh, that one there allows you to hit it very, very quickly and be a little bit less precise, which again helps you be a little bit faster and focus on getting back to the gun so overall again i do think that this is a very good value if you're looking for an out of the box competition gun a factory competition gun that doesn't cost you two two and a half grand um, but if you're a ar builder and all you do is build ars then this probably isn't going to be something that interests you now for me personally I, of course, build ARs. That's kind of what I do. So I personally probably wouldn't buy a Leadstar Arms Grand 3, but I do recognize that a lot of people just like to buy pre-built stuff. They don't want to mess with it. They just want something out of the box that just runs. And out of the box, it ran, and it ran very, very quickly. So that is about it for the video, guys. Again, let me know in the comments what you guys think of the Grunt 3 and if there's anything else that I should compare it directly against. And that's about it for me, guys. I will see you guys in the next one. Thank you so much for watching. Peace off.